The rapid growth of the immigrant population in the United States and Western Europe represents one of the most important demographic and social phenomena confronting these societies. In the United States, close to 13% of the population is foreign-born. In 2010, 1.1 million were admitted for legal permanent residence, and another 72,000 or so were admitted as refugees and asylees. While the flow of unauthorized immigration slowed down in the wake of the economic crisis beginning in 2008, the resident unauthorized population approaches, according to our best estimates, close to 11.5 million. Now, unlike flows of merchandise and capital uh, that are composed, immigrant flows are composed of people and hence tend to have social consequences. One of the most important is the reconstitution of families and the procreation of a new generation. Unlike adult immigrants who are born and educated in a foreign society and whose outlooks and plans are indelibly, indelibly marked by that experience, their children commonly become full-fledged members of the receiving societies and presented with new challenges. If their, number, their numbers are large, socializing these new cities, citizens and preparing them to become productive and successful in adulthood becomes a major policy concern. This is actually what had been happening in the United States and Western Europe. The rapid growth and diversity of this young population have naturally sparked worries and questions about its future. While public discourse and some academic essays treat this young population in blanket terms, the truth is that the term, quote, migrant children, conceals more than it reveals because of the heterogeneity of its component groups. And let's see what that happens, in what, what, what that is. First, there is a significant difference between children born abroad and those born in the receiving society. The first are immigrant children, while the second are children of immigrants. The research literature points to major differences in the social and cultural adaptation process of these two categories. In between are children born abroad uh, but brought to the host society at an early age, making them sociologically closer to the second generation. These are known as the 1.5 generation. Ruben Rumbaut has analyzed the distinct patterns of linguistic and cultural development associated with birthplace and length of time since arrival. The subsequent literature has, by and large, supported his conclusions. In the U.S., a second important distinction concerns countries of origins and socioeconomic backgrounds. As it happens, both dimensions also overlap due to several historical contingencies. Immigration to the United States has become bifurcated into a high human capital flow made up of professional workers of various kinds coming to fill positions in high-tech industries, in the economy, in the research centers and health services, and a larger manual labor flow seeking employment in labor-intensive industries such as agriculture, construction, and personal services. Professional migration greatly aided by passage of the H-1B program at Congress in 1990 comes primarily from Asia, being sourced mainly in India and China, with the smaller flows from the Philippines, South Korea, and Taiwan. Manual labor migration comes overwhelmingly from adjacent Mexico and secondarily from the countries of Central America and the Caribbean. To the disadvantages attached to low skills educations are added those of a tenuous legal status, as the majority of these migrants come surreptitiously or with short-term visas. Theoretical perspectives can be grouped into two distinct levels of analysis that may be labeled culturalist and structuralist. Culturalist views emphasize the relative assimilation of immigrants into the cultural, linguistic, and political mainstream, while structural perspectives emphasize the integration of newcomers into the socioeconomic hierarchies of the host society, focusing on such areas as occupational achievement, educational attainment, poverty, and early childbearing and incarceration. It is important to understand that cultural and structural experiences of assimilation can be decoupled 
For instance, an individual who is fully assimilated into society's cultural, linguistic, and political mainstream can still experience poor outcomes in the labor and educational markets. Conversely, an individual may not be fully integrated culturally and still do well both economically and occupationally. This table presents a review of the different theories, culturalists and structuralists, and I will review them uh, for you at this point. The first one at the top of the, uh, in the top row, uh, is the, the, that is, that is, and they can also be divided into optimistic perspectives about assimilation and pessimistic uh, ones. At the pessimistic end of the culturally spectrum uh, is the belief championed by Harvard political scientist Samuel Huntington that children of immigrants are not assimilating. In this view, certain groups, Hispanics in particular, have arrived in such large numbers in concentrated parts of the country that they are not inclined to acculturate. Immigrants and their children resist learning English place their allegiance in the interests of their ethnic communities and home countries and reject the ideals and values of the whole society. This view <coughs> is rooted in the belief that American identity is intimately tied to the Anglo-Protestant culture of the founders of the country and that Catholic newcomers from Latin America, unwilling to adopt Anglo-Protestant ways, will form their own cultural and linguistic enclaves. Hence, children of immigrants who come from societies that are deemed to be culturally incompatible with Anglo-Protestant America will not advance much into the cultural and linguistic mainstream. If this view is correct, then we should expect the second generation, especially that from Latin America, not to learn English not to interact with individuals outside their ethnic enclaves, and not to integrate to the mainstream institutions. This perspective, Huntington's, is not rooted in any original empirical research, but is rather a response to what he perceived to be forces that prevents current immigrants from assimilating to American society. Since his Huntington's writers on the issue were entirely speculative, Critics have, critics have had no difficulty in countering his assertions with evidence that Latin immigrants are capable of assimilating culturally and linguistically. For instance, there is little evidence that children of Hispanic immigrants avoid learning English or those non-English languages, or that those non-English languages en endure past the second generation. Hence, while there is much evidence that Latin American and other migrants as assimilate culturally and politically, Huntington's views are still important, still important, not so much because they are right, but because they resonate with certain, a certain set of the American public that continues to suspect evidence to the contrary that immigrants in general, and Latin immigration in particular, does harm to the institutions of the nation. On the optimistic side of the, cultural, uh, the culturalist approach that comes to the next uh, second road labeled the new melting pot, uh, this is, there are authors who have returned to the traditional melting pot theory and dusted it off for the 21st century. Uh, these authors argue that cultural and political assimilation continue to take place and that the immigrants of today are no different in that respect from those of the past. They further argue that all immigrants assimilate not into a specific se segments of American society, but rather into a broad mainstream that is simultaneously changed by them. The champions of this perspective, Professors Richard Alba and Victor Nee, describe assimilation as, quote, something that frequently happens to people while they are making other plans. These plans may, uh, they argue, are to achieve economic success. In seeking success, immigrants come into contact with the cultural features of the receiving society and then undergo linguistic and cultural assimilation. Alba and Nee's melting pot view 
argues that exposure to the whole society and assimilation to it are just inevitable. So that's the first two roads of the table. Structuralist perspectives that you see there are different. Like culturalist views, they can also be organized by their level of optimism about the future of immigrants and their children. The first of these views label generations of exclusion, or the second one in the, in the table, uh, paints a rather dismal picture of the future of some groups of immigrants and their children. This perspective describes immigrants and their youth, in particular Mexicans, as isolated from the opportunities for mobility offered by the American mainstream, not because of these immigrants' decisions to avoid assimilation, but due to membership in ethnic and racial groups that are heavily disadvantaged. In this view of things, generations of exclusion, Mexican immigrants, which are the largest foreign minority in the nation, move into communities and segments of society that have been racialized and marginalized. Pathways of, uh, of immigrants from Europe were able to assimilate both culturally and economically by gradually elbowing their way into the more privileged white segments of the American racial hierarchy. On the other hand, Mexicans, whose ancestry includes European roots, risk becoming a distinct race with consistently poor outcomes at par with those uh, experienced by uh, uh, American blacks and, uh, uh, with, uh, uh, and with extending over generations. According to this uh, perspective, we should expect children of immigrants to assimilate into the racial ethnic categories of which they are perceived to be by members of the native majority. Outcomes for these children should therefore not differ much across generations. Unlike Huntington's and Albany's perspective, children of Mexican immigrants would be assimilating into American society, but the process would not necessarily lead to joining an all-inclusive mainstream. Instead, the process would lead to their integration into the bottom of a racialized American society. Other scholars, however, believe that while immigrants enter American society as members of stratified racial groups, their, chil their children will be able to use their condition as participants in two societies and two cultures actually to their advantage. This second generation advantage thesis, which is at the top of the structural perspectives in, this, in the table, argues that unlike domestic minorities, children of immigrants possess a wealth of cultural resources and can pick and choose from a wide set of alternatives when planning out the course of their lives. Empirical support for this idea of a second generation advantage comes from a cross-sectional study of second generation young people in New York City conducted by Philip Kassinitz, Mary Waters, and, and their colleagues. At the core of the second generation advantage perspective is the belief that these youth are positioned at an intersection at s of several social and cultural currents, and as a result, the amount of information and support that they have at their disposal gives them a significant edge for upward mobility in the future. Between the optimists and the pessimists lies a structural view that does not automatically predict positive or negative outcomes, but instead takes a more nuanced approach toward the future of the second generation in America. This segmented assimilation perspective proposes that forces underlying second generation ad advantage may indeed be at play, but different groups of immigrants face distinct barriers to upward assimilation. The character of the, this, char this forces the character of the co-ethnic community, governmental policy toward particular immigrant groups, as well as race and ethnicity, can either increase or diminish the barriers to successful assimilation facing members of the second generation. These forces alone are not determinants of life outcomes because the endowments and strategies employed by immigrant parents can also be vital in overcoming obstacles to upward mobility. 
the segmented assimilation perspective does not focus so much on where, whether or not children of immigrants are assimilating, than to, but rather into what segment, what segment of society they assimilate to. This approach is supported mainly by findings from the Children of Immigrants Longitudinal Study, SEALS in its acronym, uh, conducted by Professor Ruben Rumbaud and myself between 2002, between 1992 and 2002. SEALS followed thousands of second generation youth in San Diego, California and Miami, Fort Lauderdale in Florida from middle age school through high school and then into early adulthood. Parental endow endowments, according to these perspectives, are broken down into three categories. First, the human capital or the education brought by immigrant parents. Second, the context of reception faced by them. And third, the family structure. The more human capital immigrant parents bring with them in the form of education and skills, the higher their earnings and subsequently the greater their resources to support the education of their children. Context of reception, or as it is called in the literature, mode of incorporation encountered by immigrant parents is conditioned first by the policies of the government toward their own immigrant groups, second by the general attitude in the whole society toward their, toward their group, and third by the existence and the resources of a co-ethnic community. The combination of these three contexts, government, public reception, ethnic community, can lead to a favorable mode of incorporation, a relatively neutral one, or a hostile environment in which to pursue the integration of immigrants and their children to American society. Naturally, achieving upward mobility is the more difficult when first-generation parents confront a hostile mode of incorporation. The segmented assimilation perspective offers, however, a path through which children of poorly endowed immigrants can overcome this situation, and that is labeled selective acculturation. Through selective acculturation, children assimilate to the whole society, learning its language and culture, but they also preserve their home country language, values, and customs. Children who follow such a path enjoy the benefits of speaking fluently both languages and gaining a solid foothold on the whole society while maintaining a bond with their parents' culture. These features are in turn useful in overcoming the disadvantages of low parental human capital and a negative mode of incorporation because they protect children from negative effects or based on external discrimination and the lure of gangs and, and street life. So let's go to see what happens in adolescence. What are the major outcomes that we can, uh, we can examine when these children, uh, when the children are in their teen, teen years? A good part of the literature of on immigrant, adoles on immigrant adolescent adaptation focuses on the issue of aspirations and expectations. There is good reason for this because sociological and psychological research has provided consistent evidence that of the predictive power of these social psychological factors on subsequent adult outcomes. The, underly the underlying rationale of these findings is, is fairly straightforward. Children or adolescents who aspire to a college level education may or may not fulfill their aspirations, but those who do not aspire high will not get there. In that sense, adolescent aspirations function as a necessary condition for subsequent achievement. You may uh, get there or not, but if you don't aim high, you are not surely not to get, get, uh, to get to that goal. Rather than review all individual studies, I will now summarize the general areas of agreement of the research literature on them, identifying later some of the more interesting and provocative results. In general, studies in the area of adolescent aspirations and, uh, and ambition in general converge on the following points. First, immigrant children and children of immigrants tend to have higher ambition, uh, that is aspirations 
idealistic aspiration and realistic expectations than their third generation and higher counterparts and to have generally superior academic performance. The literature supports the concept of immigrant optimism advanced by Cao and Tienda and that of immigrant drive supported by Portes and Rumbaud while also agreeing in general with the hypothesis of second generation advantage. There are, however, major differences uh, across nationalities in both ambition and performance. A groups originating in Asia tend to have higher and more stable educational and occupational expectations and to perform better in schools. Mexican and other Latin American groups and those from the Black Caribbean find themselves at the opposite end of the continuum. These differences are partly due to parental socioeconomic status, but they do not entirely disappear after controls are introduced for family socioeconomic status. These results tend to support segmented assimilation and more broadly, Tellez and Ortiz concept of generational disadvantage. Girls, third, girls consistently exhibit higher ambition and performance than boys, while older age youngsters relative to their respective school grade cohort tend to have both lower aspirations and lower academic performance. And finally, aspirations and performance are strongly correlated. Although the duration of causality is ambiguous, the most plausible interpretation at this time is that of a causal loop where aspirations support achievement ach and achievement increases aspirations. Specific studies in this area advance novel findings that point toward other significant trends. For example, Cynthia Feliciano emphasizes the importance of parental status prior to immigration as having distinct effects on ambition and performance. Her point is that it is not absolute socioeconomic status, but a status relative to the average in the sending country that makes all the difference. Similarly, Krista Pereira and Patricia Fernandez Kelly have emphasized the idea of cultural capital brought from the home country. While material capital may be higher among natives, cultural capital tends to be stronger among immigrants and their children, leading to a sustained upward drive. Drive. In support of the Generations of Exclusion thesis, Pereira finds that this key resource, the immigrant drive, dissipates or disappears by the third generation. The second area where there is a large body of literature pertains to linguistic assimilation. It's clearly, learning the language of the host society is a major precondition for moving ahead in it. More contested is the value of retaining the language of the parents. In a largely monolingual country like the United States, nativist critics have repeatedly denounced the existence of linguistic enclaves, extolled the value of English immersion programs as a means to fully integrate foreigners into the American monolingual mainstream. Contrary to these views, the empirical research literature in linguistics, educational psychology, and sociology converges on the following points. First, fluent bilingualism is associated with higher cognitive development in a wide variety of language combinations that are English, Spanish, English, French, Chinese, French, and, qu and quite a few others. Second, in the United States, fluent bilingualism is associated with better academic performance and higher self-esteem in the adolescent years. And third, fluency in the host society language is almost universal. That is, it, this is English among children of immigrants, but much less common is maintaining fluency in the language of the parents. Recent studies consistently report that coming from a bilingual, biliteral background is associated with higher academic scores, higher probability of high school graduation, and a higher chance of attending college. In all likelihood, the relationship between cognitive development and bilingualism is not one directional, that is uh, unicausal, but forms a causal loop with lack one factor reinforcing the other, that is, that is bilingualism reinforcing uh, cognitive development and uh, cognitive development reinforces the continuation of uh, bilingual ability. 
For linguists like, like Jay Cummings, the cognitive advantage of bilinguals lies in their ability to look at language rather than through language to the intended meaning, thus escaping what Cummings called, quote, the tyranny of words. In addition to its positive association with cognitive development, fluent bilingualism has the advantage of keeping channels of communication open with parents and hence allowing second generation youth to acknowledge and to value aspects of the parental culture. This promotes what we have called selective acculturation. Nevertheless, the pressures of acculturation are such that fluent bilingualism is exceptional rather than normative in the second generation. Children of poor immigrants in particular commonly fly away from their parents' language because they see it as an indicator of a subordinate position in the receiving society. So, to provide some evidence, the Children of Immigrants Longitudinal Study, to which I referred before, SEALS, found that by age 17, only 28.5% of this second generation sample could be classified as fluent bilingual. Among Asian origin kids, the figure was lower than 10%, while among Latinos, it hovered around 40%. The difference between the two groups is attributable, attributable to the lack of a common language among Asian immigrants and to the greater resources for linguistic preservation for Hispanic immigrants and their children, including television networks, numerous radio stations in Spanish, and so on. But even then, the majority, by age 17 had lost fluency in the parental language. This, that for, that, that is this uh, language that for these kids was a, a birth gift, a birthright, is actually dissipated and lost. And the same thing happens for nine tenths of Asians, including important languages like the Chinese. So let's move now to review adult outcomes. What happens when these kids reach, el, uh, reach early adulthood? Uh, results that we have seen are the prelude to the arrival of the second generation in adulthood, a time when the con combination of decisions and events happening early in life crystallize into durable outcomes. Unfortunately, the research literature that we have dealing with this stage of the adaptation process is marred by several shortcomings. First, there is a strong tendency among researchers to lump the data into panethnic categories. As I have noted repeatedly in the past, but certainly to no avail, these categories obscure more than they reveal. The label Hispanic, for example, lumps multiple nationalities and multiple generations, concealing the considerable differences that exist among them. Cuban, Mexican, Puerto Rican, Argentine, first, second, gener third generation, blacks, whites, and others. Similarly, the label Asian is a still more egregious because these groups do not even share a common language. Second, studies of the second generation in adulthood have been mostly cross-sectional, that is transversal, relying and rely on retroactive reports to measure events that occur early in life. This design suffers from two major causal flaws. First, it cannot establish a reliable causal order among variables because retroactive reports about earlier causes by respondents are easily colored by what happened afterwards, by subsequent events. More importantly, samples taken in adulthood, even those drawn random randomly, eliminate or censor out members of the relevant population who have selectively fallen off the universe that is used for these samples. In the case of the, the that is, in the case of the second generation, key outcomes indicative of a negative a or a downward assimilation path, such as being imprisoned for a felony, being deported in the case of 1.5 generation youth who have committed crimes, or leaving the country for various reasons, selectively remove individuals from the civilian population used as a sampling frame. The ensuing results invariably yield an excessively optimistic account of the adaptation process because they have, these results have censored out the more problematic groups that have fallen by the wayside. 
This is what happened with the New York City study uh, that furnished the empirical basis for the optimistic second generation advantage hypothesis. The combinations of these shortcomings render the data produced by transversal studies in adulthood of valid, of valid value for assessing second generation adaptation outcomes. Therefore, that leaves us with two main valid data sources for the evaluation of adult outcome among children of immigrants. First, analysis based on a combination of census and current population survey data. And second, the only two large long longitudinal studies that have been conducted on this population so far, the SILS and the Mexican-American project of Edward Tellez and Vilma Ortiz. Today, in our view, the best study on the basis of publicly available census data has been produced by Ruben Rumbaut. He used 2,000 census data for the foreign-born population and adjusted results on the basis of combined 1998 to 2002 current population survey data to yield a series of crucial estimates for the second generation. This table presents the basic results of this analysis of the analysis constructed by Rumbaut on the basis of this data. Uh, the foreign born, for this data, the foreign born that arrive as children under age 18 and the native born of foreign parentage, the, that is what is called the second generation proper. The table includes results for three major Latin American nationalities, that is Cubans, Central Americans, and Mexicans, for three Asian origin nationalities, Chinese, Indian, and Korean, and for comparison, native parentage, whites, and blacks. Results from the Rumbaud study can be summarized as follows. First, there is a significant progress from the first to the second generation in terms of educational attainment. You can compare the columns at the left from foreign born to native born concerning high school dropout and college graduates. Second generation outcomes approach native white average levels. So the level of the percent college gradu graduates among a second generation uh, children born for foreign parents is 27.3% compared to 30.7% for native parentage whites. Second, while all nationalities make educational progress, second generation Mexican and Central Americans, that is Guatemalans and Salvadorians, fall significantly behind native whites in both rates of high school completion and college graduation. As you can see in the panel of the table, in the case of Mexicans, 24% drop out of high school comparing to it 9% among native parentage whites and only 13% graduate from college compared with about 31% for native whites. Second generation Cubans, on the other hand, are at par, that is at the same level as native whites, and all Asian nationalities surpass white educational average in both the first and the second generation. That is, the levels of educational achievement among Chinese, Indian, Korean, and other Asians are significantly higher than among the native parentage population, both whites and blacks. Now, moving to the right, to the right of the table, we find that male, male incarceration rates increase from all nationalities, from the first or foreign-born to the second generation, an indicator of downward assimilation, but Mex Mexican incarceration rates increase the most, and no Latin American second generation rates significantly exceed the native white average. So by the second generation, the rate of me me male Mexican incarceration is about 6%. Uh, in young age as to compare with less than 2% for native, uh, native parentage whites. Uh, and uh, the, same, the same increase we see among Central American immigrants. Male incarceration rates for Asian origin groups, on the other hand, are the lowest, either in the first or second generation. They are indeed much lower than among native whites. They don't reach 1% of this population of Chinese, Indian, and Koreas in either the first or the second generation. Moving then to the last column, female fertility rates in adolescence and early adulthood decline across generations for all Latin nationalities, but they, they decline the least among Mexican-Americans. Indeed, Mexican fertility rates far exceed those of native white females 
and, even, and are even above those of African Americans. Uh, as we can see there, the Mexican uh, fertility rate by age 20, 24 uh, among females is 25% of uh, the population having had children as compared with 16% of native parentage wives and 22% among African Americans. Uh, Cuban fertility rates, on the other hand, fall below that those of native white women. And Asian fertility rates are minimal and decline further between generations, both uh, rates representing but a faction of the native white figures. As a whole, the results that are presented by Rumbaut uh, are congruent with the segmented assimilation hypothesis, indicating a clear bifurcation among immigrant nationalities in all these outcomes, education, uh, fertility, uh, the adolescent, uh, childbearing, and uh, the chances for uh, incarceration. They also provide generally support for, for the inclusive mainstream view advanced by Richard Alba and Victor Nee by showing significant average educational progress and a fertility declines from the first to the second generation. However, that thesis of uh, that assimilation is thesis is weakened by the consistent rise in male incarceration rates between the first and second generation and, the by, and by the pattern and vast differences in the adult outcomes displayed by different nationalities. SEALs, the children of immigrants longitudinal study is of course the empirical basis for the segmented assimilation thesis. And hence, it is not surprising that results support that perspective. The principal strength of this finding is that they were grounded on longitudinal data that prevents selective elimination of negative assimilation outcomes in adolescents, as it happens in transversal studies of adults, and that permit a clear time order among variables to establish what leads to what. The next table presents the summary of results from the SEALs conducted when respondents had reached average age 24. The study focused on objective, hard outcomes of the adaptation process, such as educational achievement, unemployment, adolescent childbearing, adult incarceration rates. The findings from this table can be summarized in five main points. First, there are significant and non-random differences across second-generation nationalities that correspond to the known profile of the first generation in terms of human capital and modes of incorporation. Early school abandonment, for example, ranges from a low of about 7% among Chinese Koreans to a high of 47% among Cambodians and Laotians. Similarly, teenage childbearing rates among females range from 0% among second-generation Chinese Koreans and 0% among Cubans to a remarkable 48% among Mexicans. So by, the, by age 24, it shows that Mexican-American second-generation females have had children, that is 48%, have had children by that age. Similarly, rates of incarceration for males by average age 24 range from 0% for Chinese Koreans and just 4% for Cubans to 17% for Mexican and 18% for West Indians. That means that by early adulthood, almost one in five of men from these two groups find themselves behind bars. As shown, and this is, these are the general views. As shown in the next figures, figures 1, 3, these differences are resilient uh, after controlling for other variables. Uh, in results in the figures that I present can be summarized in the following terms. And we are going to see it. First, the males, the column males, achieve less educationally and occupationally and are significantly more prone to downward assimilation events even after controlling for other predictors. This, th this chart portrays determinants of educational achievement by age 24. The, the columns under zero indicate negative effects. As we can see, there is a strong negative effect for older older uh, migrants and for males, the positive effects 
are on the other side. And as we can see also, there is a negative effect controlling for everything else for Mexican origins. This next one uh, presents the determinants of occupational attainment in terms of occupational prestige scores. And again, males fall, fall below the bar and, and do considerably wor worse than females. Predictably higher family socioeconomic status being raised in two immigrant families and so on are po have positive effects on occupational attainment by, uh, by early childhood. And as we, we have seen controlling for everything else, we have again a negative, a significant negative Mexican, uh, uh, Mexican effect. Observe that for educational attainment in the first graph, uh, both uh, Haitians and West Indians do rather well. That is, controlling for other factors, they tend to have higher levels of educational attainment. That does not translate too well in terms of occupational, uh, if, of occupational attainment, and even worse when we examine determinants of, uh, of downward assimilation uh, in the second generation. This, uh, this, uh, the dependent variable in this figure is the downward assimilation index that is constructed by the sum of events indicative of downward assimilation in early adulthood, like being unemployed, having been arrested for, having been incarcerated for a felony, having had children in early adolescence, having living in poverty. And when those are combined into this downward assimilation index, we see that males are again at a disadvantage. Parent, children who were raised by in, in intact families, two natural parents, those who come from higher family, SES families, fam uh, uh, households and so on, do better. Those who had higher uh, grades in high school. But when we control for everything else, we find that generally Cubans have a significant advantage in avoiding downward assimilation, while the three nationalities that we noted before, Haitians, Mexicans, and West Indians, are uh, at the opposite end. A Mexican-American background leads to negative results in all indicators of adaptation, in including education, occupation, and incidence of downward assimilation. Haitian Americans and West Indians exhibit high levels of educational attainment, as we saw, but then they are also at risk of events of downward assimilation uh, a, in the second generation, as this graph, graph show. So again, in support of the, down, of the segmented assimilation approach, we see major differences between uh, immigrant nationalities that do not disappear when controlling for family socioeconomic status family structure, and even uh, indicators of early high, uh, high school uh, achievement in terms of grades and others. Finally, the most important study conducted recently in this field is the Longitudinal Survey of Mexican Americans by Tellez and Ortiz. As I saw, as we noted, noted previously, this study furnished the empirical basis for the generations of exclusion thesis. The fundamental and disturbing finding from that study is that while there is significant progress between the first and second generations, subsequent generations of Mexicans stagnate at comparable educational and occupational levels. They never catch up to white, to native white averages. For instance, according to Tellez and Ortiz, the odds of Mexicans to white high school graduation rise from 0.06 to 1 among first generation immigrants to 0.58 to 1, that is more than half among their second generation children, but then decline in the third generation to 0.30 to 1 among members of the third, fourth, and even fifth generation. Similarly, the odds of achieving a college degree follow a similar course from 0.12 to 1 in the immigrant generation to 0.28 to 1 in the second, declining again to 0.12 to 1 in the fourth and higher generations. After examining a number of other possible determinants, Tellez and Ortiz point, pin the primary responsibility for these negative results on what they call the racialization of Mexican-American children. They are stereotyped by teachers and school authorities as innately inferior to white and Asian students, 
and are treated accordingly. This treatment devolves into a self-fulfilling prophecy as Mexican origin youth close ranks to defend themselves against discrimination. In the process, however, they abandon aspirations for high academic achievement and come to reject members of their own group who attempt to move higher, uh, accusing them of, quote, acting white. Tejes and Ortiz summarize the process at hand as follows, quote, the signals and racial stereotypes that educators and society send to students affect the extent to which they will engage and persist in a school. Racial stereotypes produce a positive self-identity for white and Asian students, but a negative one for blacks and Latinos, which affect school success. Racialized self-perceptions among Mexican-American students generally endure into the third and fourth generations. These conclusions reached by Tejas and Ortiz, of course, contradict optimistic accounts of the assimilation process across generations and the notion of an all-inclusive mainstream. They support or agree with the segmented assimilation hypothesis on two points. First, that contextual factors play a decisive role in the outcomes of assimilation in the second generation. And second, the existence of an achievement drive among first generation immigrants that they seek to transmit to their offspring, but that dissipates rather quickly with increasing acculturation. To conclude, from this review, it is evident that the assimilation of immigrants and their children to the whole society is not simple, homogeneous, or unproblematic. On the positive side, much progress is made on average from the first to the second generation, both along the cultural and structural dimensions. On the less rosy side, many individuals and entire collectivities confront significant barriers to advancement, either because of their own lack of economic resources and education or because of an unfavorable external context. For the culturalist uh, school, the important thing is that immigrants and their children acculturate, shedding their old ways and language and becoming uh, Americans as Americans as anyone else. For this school, it does not matter much whether they do not make socioeconomic prog progress, provided that they cease to be foreign. Huntington's complaint is that immigrants in general, and Latins in particular, do not wish to do so. Alba and Ni, nee, reflecting more accurately the actual empirical evidence, expect everyone to acculturate. The important thing for these authors is that immigrants and their children cease to be ethnic. Structuralist writings are more concerned with the socioeconomic outcomes of the adaptation process. These perspectives pay greater attention to the fact that immigrants and their descendants can fully acculturate and yet neither move upward occupationally and economically nor be accepted into the middle class mainstream. For immigrant parents, aspirations are certainly more structural than cultural. They generally care much less that their children join an undifferentiated cultural mainstream that they, than that they move ahead educationally and then economically. But if that is the goal, the data at hand indicate that many immigrant children are not making it. The overall advancement of this population is largely driven, the averages are largely driven by the good performance and the high outcomes of youth from professional immigrant families well received in America, like most Asian immigrants, or of middle class refugees who have benefited from extensive governmental assistance and sometimes from strong co-ethnic communities. They all have been the beneficiaries of a favorable mode of incorporation. At the other end, however, average socioeconomic outcomes, outcomes are driven down by the poor educational and economic performance of children from unskilled migrant families, often handicapped further by an unauthorized or insecure legal status, a negative mode of incorporation. From a policy viewpoint, this must be the population of greatest concern and greatest interest. A first and urgent policy measure is the legalization of the one of 1.5 generation youth who are now unauthorized migrants. These children were brought involuntarily into the United States by their parents. Through no fault of their own, they find themselves blocked from access to higher education and many, every other, and many everyday needs 
such as a driver's license because of their uh, unauthorized status. This is not an insignificant population. In 2008, almost half of immigrant youth aged 18 to 34 were in this situation. This is the population that have become, that have popularly come to be known as the dreamers. As Rumbaut and Komaye put it in a recent article, for foreign-born young adults, an undocumented status blocks access to the opportunity structure and path to social mobility. It has become all the more consequential since the passage of the draconian federal laws of 1996 on immigration and the failure of Congress to pass comprehensive immigration reform, a situation that lasts to our day. The limited longitudinal data that we have on the adaptation of migrant children also point to the importance of outside assistance to guide the most disadvantaged members of this population and help them stay in school. A recent study based on the SEALS data found that a consistent feature of respondents who had managed to succeed educationally and occupationally despite poor and undocumented parents and a handicap or bringing was the presence of volunteers who came to the schools and exposed these kids to a different world. The same study found that cultural capital brought from the parents' home country provided a significant boon in these cases because the, it anchored adolescent self-identities and strengthened their aspirations. These cultural memories help fend discrimination, maintain a disciplined stance, a stance towards schoolwork, and prevent downward assimilation. Naturally, cultural capital brought from the home country is a product of selective acculturation. The absence of, this, of, of, of it deprives youth of this resource as they lose contract, contact or even reject the language and the culture of their parents. Whatever resources are embodied in that culture effectively dissipate in the absence of this uh, pattern of selective acculturation. These results highlight a key findings from this review and the, and the literature that we have examined uh, in this uh, talk. Namely, that an additive stance that combines the old and the new tends to yield better outcomes than a subtractive one. Huntington's followers will continue to rally against the foreign traits that immigrants bring along. Evidence on the grounds, however, points to the paradox that preservation of cultural elements from immigrant parents' home countries can provide children with the necessary psychological anchoring and the motivation to succeed in their new country. While acculturation is inevitably leading, among other things, to a steady decline in the knowledge of foreign languages, it does not lead inevitably to positive social and economic outcomes. A sizable minority of children is at risk of downward assimilation, especially those uh, stemming from family backgrounds disadvantaged by low parental human capital and by a negative mode of incorporation. These, these children are in need of urgent external assistance lest we come to witness a repeat of earlier loss, second and third generations racialized and confined to the nation's inner cities, if not to their prisons. That urgent assistance must take the form of, of providing guidance for educational achievement and of helping youth preserve elements of their parents' culture as an anchor for their self-esteem and to guide their ambitions toward the future. Thank you very much.